A dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. John Calvin. Get in the long teams with a bunch of demons. Do you really believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. <laughs> There's probably a, a balance between, I believe you have to know Christ, but... God, he's in hell. He is. And someone knows this for sure. All of mankind is going to end up somewhere in heaven. <laughs> My mission really is to just help people of faith, especially, to re-examine this issue, to realize the church has got things wrong in the past. For those who are gods by faith in his son... <laughs> Right? 2 Corinthians 3 7. Victory in the name which is above every name. There's no exception for rape or incest. Uh, it's an extreme law. <laughs> and... Right now, bones, ligaments, tendons, in Jesus' name, get out here right now. <laughs> so put your trust in the sovereign risen king. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Master's Dog, episode 53. I am your host, the Evangelical Norm. So we're going to jump right in today. We're going to be back with our friends from Saints Unscripted, uh, the faith and beliefs uh, segment of their podcast. David is in part three of the little trip through Christian history. I, I do find it interesting that he does not call it church history. They can't call it really call it church history because, in their view, everything that is going on that he's talking about is apostate anyway. So he is calling it the the history of Christianity, which so interesting why they're even really concerned with it, and he doesn't really get into any of what is apostate or anything like that. I mean, he really does just present a, a pretty straightforward, a pretty academic uh, look at the history of Christianity that he's just finished up talking about uh, uh, Constantine. We just passed 325 AD and the Council of Nicaea and so on. So he's going to pick up there and carry on through uh, about to, I want to say he's going to go up to about 600 AD in this and there's really not a lot in here but there is one or two things that he mentions that I kind of want to talk about so with that I'm going to go ahead and let David uh, say hey guys and do his thing hey guys so this episode <laughs> hey guys so this episode is part three in a little mini series we're doing on early Christianity if you haven't seen part one and two check those out we left off in the 4th century with Roman Emperor Constantine. Let's jump right, right back in. After Constantine's controversial conversion to Christianity, he starts to incentivize his pagan citizens to convert. Christians are getting high-ranking government positions. The clergy is getting tax breaks. I guess we know who's the teacher's pet. Scott! 
And in 330 AD, he moves the capital of the Roman Empire to the newly built Christian city, Constantinople. Constantinople was at the center of the... I just have to mention, it... <sighs> I don't know why they insist, and I don't know, it's it's their shtick, it's their thing, it's what they do, but they continually put in these little uh, comedic clips into the, their uh, videos. I've explained some of this before. When you take something, it's, it's a psychological thing, um, which, I mean, this, it really isn't necessary, but when they're taking things that are are very controversial uh, issues, uh, in the nature of God and uh, things like that, the Book of Mormon, things that are, are very uh, conflicting between Christian views and Mormon views. They do this and it, it, it's kind of an off-putting, you know, as you're, if you're a Christian watching it, um, you know, as they're talking these things and, and really, uh, making the claim that, that Christian belief is wrong to try to soften the blow. They, they put these little things in there. Um, so again, I, I, it just, it, it really actually bothers me. I would rather them just get to the point. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe people really do, uh, enjoy it, but it just seems like even now it, it's more and more unnecessary, uh, things that they they throw in um, I don't know if it's the the whole issue of uh, attention span or what I don't, I don't know it, it's just it's really weird that the these are all just chock full of these uh, little comedic clips that really add nothing to um, the value of the video so that's that's my own little pet peeve nothing nothing wrong per se with it, it just, it irritates me. The economic world as an important trade city, the doorway to the Black Sea from the Mediterranean. And it was a key military location as it was smack dab in the middle of the most logical land route into the empire from the east. Constantine builds a fantastic series of defenses that would protect the city for hundreds of years. You can go on Google Earth right now and still see the ruins of the walls. But anyway, after Constantine's death, a lot happens. His cousin, Emperor Julian, converts to paganism and tries to crush Christianity. It doesn't work. He dies in 363 and he earns himself the title Julian the Apostate. It's a rather unfortunate name. In 380, Julian rolls over in his grave after the Edict of Thessalonica is issued under Emperor Theodosius, which made Nicene Christianity the official Roman religion. But despite that, there was still a lot of turmoil within the church concerning the Nicene Creed and Arianism, which we talked about in the last episode. So in 381, Theodosius calls together the First Council of Constantinople, which affirmed and expanded upon the Nicene Creed. Non-Nicene Christian denominations were anathematized and, often under the advisement of Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, Theodosius would continue to issue edicts against paganism into the 390s. Pagan temples were destroyed, sacrifices were prohibited, the Olympic Games were abolished, Christians were chiseling crosses on pagan statues. It was a rough time for pagans. Now, it's important to note that the 4th century was crucial to the development of the Bible canon. It had been brought up in multiple councils and it was generally understood by the end of the century which books were legit and which were not. Okay, this is the first place that I really want to take a minute and, and really the rest of the video is, is kind of pointless. He, he point, there are some things, but nothing that I really want to talk about. This was the thing I want to talk about because it gives the, the impression and there's so many people who think the Bible was, was not, uh, we didn't have a Bible until the council of Nicaea, which the council of Nicaea had nothing to do with the canon of scripture at all of any of the canons that, that were in the council of Nicaea. And I want to say, I want to say there was somewhere between 20 and 25. I don't remember the exact number, maybe 23. But um, out of all the canons, so these were, these canons were the things that were discussed, the, the important points that had to be affirmed or discussed. None of them during, at Nicaea had to do with the canon of scripture because the canon was essentially set 
and it was it was not that anybody had to sit down and go these are the books that are allowed in the bible and they, not like they threw some out or anything else from the early church these books that that we have today from the the early 2nd century even late 1st century these books were what were accepted and we know this because we have different fragments from early 2nd century um, to, you know, er, early 2nd to early 3rd century. So from the 120s to the 250s, we have a lot of fragments that contain all of the current books of the New Testament that we know, except for James, was the only one that was, was in question. And it was because a lot of people were like, well, what James wasn't really an apostle. He was a brother of Jesus. He did become essentially the Bishop of Jerusalem, um, at some point in time. And, and so, uh, finally that was, so that would be the only outlier book, but from very early on, we knew that, that those books, the, 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 um, 27, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament, um, 66. Uh, and so those books were the books that were authoritative as scripture and recognized as such. And we even to the point, if we had no, we, ha and it, we have thousands of manuscripts of those partial and fragments and so on, but we have them. Um, and even if we didn't, all the early church fathers up through the third century had quoted scripture in all of their writing, all their writings, we can pull out the entirety of the New Testament. And I want to say, except for like nine, 10 verses or something like that, that, that don't appear in the writings of the early fathers that do appear in the, what we have as a Bible. And some of those are the interpolated things like in Mark and stuff like that, that most scholars now go, well, I don't think, we don't think those were actually in the autographs but were somewhere added in later very few verses um in case you want to go off on that tangent but by the 400s now maybe these these councils and i'm not real uh familiar with all the councils of constantinople and the councils of ephesus and so on um maybe they did do have a little bit where they talked about and affirmed what was canon and as people were trying to come in again with, with things like the gospel of, of Thomas, um, the gospel of Mary, uh, and so on. Some of these other, uh, books that were written far later, you know, obvious books that were written. I mean, the gospel of Thomas is, is scholarly, uh, estimates could not have been written any earlier than the third century, um, and others, the Gospel of Judas and, and stuff like that. So none of these books, that, and so that may have been what they dealt with of people going, hey, look, this is scripture. No, it's not. It wasn't in here. We didn't, we've didn't. we never dealt with that as scripture before. We're not adding it now. So maybe there was a finalization. But in reality, the canon of scripture was set by the end of the first century. The canon of scripture was there and recognized by all of the church uh, as authoritative. So to say that the fourth century was uh, whatever he just said was a, a key in the development of the the canon, I I would say that's that's false. That's a false statement. the The development of canon was set far earlier than the fourth century, and it, at the fourth century, it, it came to the point where it was like we have to start. Uh, securing the canon or defending, guarding the canon and not letting uh, Gnostic and, and other false uh, writings sneak their way in, if that makes sense. After the death of Theodosius, the empire is split into eastern and western halves again. The eastern half prospered and the western half not so much. It was constantly under attack from Germanic tribes in the north, it was suffering economically, and leadership was lacking. In 410, the Visigoths sack Rome. In 455, the Vandals sack it again. Other parts of the Western Empire are being conquered, and finally in 476 AD, 
Rome is captured by Germanic tribes and the Western Roman Empire is no more. But in the midst of the fall of the West, we've still got ecumenical councils going on in the East. This is fine. Theodosius II convened the first council of Ephesus in 431 AD, and later in 451 AD, Emperor Marcion convened the council of Chalcedon. Both councils dealt further with questions about the nature of Jesus Christ as God, and you can read more about those councils in the description. As we glaze over this history at 50,000 miles per hour, we <laughs> we also need to keep track of the Bishop of Rome, because in the 5th century, the title Pope becomes increasingly reserved to him, and eventually he'll exercise authority over the entire Roman Catholic Church. But that didn't happen all at once. Now, to be fair, there are many Catholics who would disagree with that, which is fine, but there are also many Catholics who are perfectly fine with the idea that papal supremacy was something that developed over time. But the decline and fall of the Western Roman Empire marks a pivotal point in this evolution. As civil authority in Rome weakens, the Pope starts to fill in the gaps. For example, Pope Leo I negotiates with invaders on multiple occasions, Attila the Hun in 452 and the Vandals in 455 to varying success. So Leo's got some civil power, but he also really pushed for religious papal supremacy. He recognized the importance of having a central leading figure and taught, like some before him, that as the Bishop of Rome, he was the heir of and spoke for the Apostle Peter. Point being, civil and religious authority were becoming more mixed than ever before. Throughout the 6th century, we see this process continue as Rome trades hands several times and the clergy is largely left to pick up the pieces. Meanwhile, in the 530s, Emperor Justinian I builds the great Hagia Sophia, and in 553, against the wishes of the Pope, he holds the Second Council of Constantinople, which we talked about very briefly in this episode. Christianity continues to spread throughout the ancient world in this century, and tensions are rising between the church in the East and the church in the West, which we'll talk more about in the next episode. Check out the links and notes in the description for more info on this. Feel free to fill in some of the blanks in the comments, and have a great day. All right, so there you go. And, and you know, we're going to... as as the next couple episodes, it'll be interesting to see once we get into, once he gets into uh, the Protestant Reformation and so on. So a lot of this is going to be, I mean, obviously until, until the Reformation, until Luther and Zwingli and, and, and guys like that, Knox and Huss and, and so on. It was very um, Catholic and Christian and, and Protestant history go together and then we have the split and so uh a lot of what we're going to get over the next little bit is going to be you know the progression of popes i'm, I'm interested to see if he's going to talk about the times when there were multiple popes and so on so uh it's going to be interesting and again i don't know that there's a whole lot uh theologically obviously there is going to be some stuff that comes up and so we will continue to respond we me I will continue to respond um, to each and every one of these episodes and just see where it takes us. I'm really excited to see um, if David's view of the Protestant Reformation is uh, similar to what Kwaku has expressed in different uh, debates and videos that he's put on um, now that he's no longer part of the the. the I keep wanting to call them three Mormons again, uh, the Saints Unscripted group. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if Kwaku gets thrown under the bus in any of these videos. I know they're not going to bring him up, but if any of you have watched, followed him, followed my responses to him, uh, followed anybody's responses to him and the, the Saints Unscripted, you'll know that, that obviously there is a separation in some of the things that they uh, hold to. So, Thanks for hanging out. Um, hope this was beneficial to any of you um, who watched. Uh, it was it was interesting, and it always is interesting to see what the Mormons think about different things. So, as always, preach the gospel at all times. Use words; they're necessary. And until next time, soli deo gloria. Mm -hmm.